You're listening to Out of the Box with Rosie Tran. Out of the Box is sponsored by HugMeTease.com. Spread love, give a hug, HugMeTease.com. Guys, check us out on Stitcher, iTunes, and SoundCloud, and leave us a positive comment or click on the subscribe button. It really, really helps us out a lot. And I just want to thank everyone for the positive feedback for the last few episodes. I've been getting a lot of great positive emails And as you guys know, I love positive emails, but what I love even more is when you guys go on iTunes.com, Out of the Box Podcast, and leave a positive comment. That helps us out so much more than an email. And I do appreciate the emails and I love them so much, but the positive comments help our rankings and then that helps out the podcast. So if you really enjoy the podcast, that's a great way to support us um, in lieu of donating. So I am excited today, as always, because I have some amazing guests for 2015, and this guy is a favorite from 2014. He is now a out-of-the-box regular and the first person to be invited back. He has a new book out, Jake DeSillis. Jake, how are you? Hey, Rosie. I'm great, thanks. Thanks so much. I'm honored to be the first person to be invited back. Wow, that's awesome. (laughs) Well, the other guests have been awesome, but I've just had so many guests in the queue and lined up that I haven't been able to invite some of my favorites back from last year. So um, I was actually tweeting at you about tiny houses. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And then I was like, I should have Jake back because I think he has a new book. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, I actually released this book um, uh, just in, in 2014, but it, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased with it. It's called Becoming an Entrepreneur, and it's about how to find freedom of fulfillment as a business owner. And now that I've got that one out, I've also just finished another one, which I haven't published yet. But uh, So since I last spoke to you, I've got one book published and another one on the way. So you've got the writing bug bitten you. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. (laughs) Um, I wanted to mention, I know this doesn't have anything to do with you, but I wanted to mention the tiny house movement because it's something that's in line with what you preach. And, you know, it's not for everyone. It's definitely unique. I don't know if you were able to look into it, but a lot of people are downgrading to the simple lifestyle because they're just tired of the overconsumption, the rat race, and they want to live a simpler life. And the reason I bring this up is because last time I talked to you, You're back in the UK, but you had left the UK and gone to Mexico and Mm. you were telling me that you just had all this crap back in the UK and you were like, I don't need this. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And yeah, I'm, I'm since, since we spoke, uh, I've gone even more minimalist and I'm now in the process of selling off everything. Uh, my wife and I are going to travel the world permanently uh, or at least indefinitely. <laughs> and uh, so we decided, you know, we, we, we spent the last couple of years going abroad and coming back to the UK. And, and uh, as we talked about last time, just realizing that we had all this stuff in storage that we just don't use and we just don't need and we just didn't miss either. And we had such an amazing time uh, living in Mexico and traveling. And given that um, I write and my wife has a, a, a website and she works online too, we don't need to be here. So we're we're planning on going just completely minimalist. We're getting rid of everything. I and, wanted to uh, ask you about that because you said mm. you just put everything in storage. Now, what are we talking about? One storage unit? Are we talking about multiple storage units? I mean, you're an, uh, an above average guy, but you know, obviously the stuff is probably what average people have. How much crap is really just t- totally unnecessary? Oh yeah, no. It was uh, it was a, a van load of uh, cardboard boxes and uh, and other things that we put in one storage unit. Um, we we just kind of hired a guy who had a lorry and stuck it all in there and, and, and put it in a storage <laughs> unit. Um, and uh, and it was just you know it's, it's stuff that you accumulate over time. Um, just files and paper and clothes and sports equipment and <laughs> stuff in the kitchen that we weren't using and. I, I really have, I feel so much better having got rid of that stuff. It's, it's such a, a great feeling of uh, freedom. And I, I've gone completely paperless and I've got rid of uh, all of these boxes of stuff. And, um, and to come back to the, the point that you made about the, the tiny house movement, I was super interested in the links that you, that you uh, gave me because it's actually really interesting as one example of a way that people are finding ways to quit the rat race and and live more frugally and realizing that we just that the the kind of extent to which housing has become 
way, way more than a place to live. It's become part of a sort of status symbol game that a lot of people get sucked into and then get hugely in debt with. So I think the tiny house movement is fascinating. And I've actually interviewed uh, someone who, who did uh, uh, move from a, a, a very expensive house in California up into the hills with her family and built a tiny house. And I think it's a, a really, really fascinating movement. It's a, it, it's sort of. I'm not really the kind of person who'd be that into building my own house. I think there's a, there's a, you, you've got to be into that, you know. It's a major project. <laughs> but I think if that's the kind of thing that you enjoy doing, it's just an awesome, awesome idea. Yeah, I think it's great, and I, I really want to focus on the minimalism because all of the research shows that what we're preaching in society with the consumerism, the bigger, the better, the more, is actually the opposite of what makes you happy according to scientific proof. Right. The scientific right. proof says less is more, yet our society is consume, 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 and obviously that's promoting the capitalistic mentality. And, and I'm not anti-capitalist. I'm actually what we call a conscious capitalist, which is a little different. Um, but I, I just think it's too much and I wanted to highlight that you've been minimalizing and it is making you happier. Totally, totally. And you know, it's interesting what you say because I do, I've been doing a lot of research on this for, for the book that I'm writing at the moment about different ways to quit the rat race because I've been speaking to people who have found their own ways of quitting the rat race and we talked a little bit about that the last time uh, I was on your show. And I've been looking at this culture this sort of consumer culture and thinking about, you know, what's driving this. And I, I think there's, there's a lot of reasons that people get locked into this situation where they're having to work to consume stuff that doesn't even really make them happy. It doesn't even really, you know, make them feel good. And so it's kind of a vicious circle. And I think there's a lot of things that underline it. But I think it's also a, a, something that has changed in culture in in sort of in the last century it became something that that was a lot more destructive i think and one of the reasons for that is the way that the financial system uh, changed in the 20th century and we had this massive inflation where money that used to be in the 19th century was really stable in value if you made savings and sort of put them away under your mattress then they grew in value whereas in the times that we live in and you know for the last 100 years Money has the value leaking out of it the whole time through inflation, the through fiat, the fiat currencies as well. Yeah, too. through fiat currencies, exactly, through increases in the money supply. And you know what? The interesting thing is that I think this actually has a cultural effect because what it means is people adopt a mentality of living for today and an idea that, you know, I might as well spend this uh, while it's still worth something. And alongside that, there's a general sense of doom and apathy about the future <laughs> you know a lot of people especially I'm if you look at, because it's true but it sounds so morbid <laughs> yeah I mean I actually call I call the mainstream news doom porn because that's you know that's oh kind my of, god that's a perfect that, term <laughs> that, that's what you see if you watch the news you know what you see is a totally warped view of humanity you see the the latest and loudest emergencies where people are you know uh, where there's death and destruction and violence and so forth and of course these things things happen but they're on the news because they 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 give you a fight or flight response they're exciting in a kind of uh, nasty way and that i think is, is that that whole kind of atmosphere from the media as well as the way that the economic system has developed has given rise to this culture of, of a sense of ap apathy and a sense that you might as well spend your money today because it's not going to be worth anything tomorrow. And in that context, it's kind of not surprising that people just go out at the weekend and just blow all their money on stuff that doesn't even really make them happy. And they buy crap that, that you know they think will, will provide them with a bit of retail therapy, which actually in the end gets them more and more in debt. So, yeah, I totally agree with you that, that I think minimalism is a, is a much happier way to live. And it's it's very much against all of the cultural messages that you get in the media and in the mainstream culture. Let me just add a couple things to what you said. First of all, I totally agree with what you said. And I think that doom porn is we need to make that a hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> but that is hilarious and so true. But in addition to that. You know, kind of what I said earlier with the scientific studies showing that less actually equals more happiness and we're ta being taught or, or socialized the opposite. Also, 
the statistics show that we are living in the most prosperous time that's ever existed. There's less death from disease. There's less death. Basically, the news doesn't match reality. Absolutely. What's, what's being shown is 2% of what's going on, and it's hysteria and negative to, to drum up ratings and other things. And the actual, you know, of course, of course, Jake, there's still horrible things. There's still inequality. There's still poverty. There's still hunger. There's things that still exist, which I believe are man-made and we could cure all of these with our modern technology and a little rebalancing of our mindset within, you know, a month if we really, really as a society came together. Poverty it shouldn't even be an issue. Um, you know, hunger should not be an issue in this day and age. However, it is. Um, but but the actual disasters and catastrophes and, and mass, you know, black deaths and all these horrible things, the statistics show that that's less than ever in the history of the world. So that's the news is showing contrary to what's going on in reality, actually. Yeah, totally. And um, there's a wonderful book called The Rational Optimist by Matt Ridley, which uh, is a very interesting book. If you want to read about why this is the best time that there has ever been to be alive, and not just if you're living in the West, but for the, for the world as a whole, why we live in a time when there's been an incredible real decrease in poverty, incredible growth, an incredible opportunity, as well as, of course, all the problems that you mentioned. But people are living longer. They're getting better. Exactly. Triple. They, triple what used to be. Yeah. They, they have healthier diets. They're getting more calories. There's less starvation. There's less... Uh, uh, absolute poverty and you know we have an amazing uh, technological breakthrough that we're in a new age with uh, the digital age with the internet where we we haven't even seen the beginning of the thing the kinds of things that this is going to do to transform our society so i think it's an amazing time to be to be alive and the best possible time in history so far that you could be alive and you would never know that if you watch the news because you'd get the <laughs> sense that you know that everything everything's used falling to be, apart. <laughs> yeah, everything used to be great in some kind of mystical time, maybe uh, you know, fifty years ago, or maybe before that, and now things are all falling apart. That's the kind of uh, the idea that the news gives you. And of course, there are terrible injustices in the world, and there are terrible uh, things that are wrong with the way that our society currently works. But the most important thing, I think, is that. If you want to find freedom in this world, in this unfree world that we live in, you can do. And you can do it if you take action on the things that you can actually influence. That's what always excites me is what can you do to, to grab more freedom in your own life? That's why I'm interested in entrepreneurship and financial independence and these kinds of things. Because these are real tangible things that individuals can do to change their own lives. Whereas if you let the media set your agenda of what you're thinking about and you worry about global events that you have no influence over or even national political events that you have no influence over, then it, it, it totally disempowers you and it puts you in a situation where you feel like you are the victim of forces outside your control. And, and that's the mindset that I, I really want to try and you know do my part to, to change in, in whatever way, small way that I can by talking about things like entrepreneurship and financial independence and minimalism because these are the things that you can actively do to change your life. And, and to affect to, your life 100% instead of complaining about the government or complaining about whatever else that you can't control. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk about a couple of things you brought up. You, Oh my God, so many good points. I'm like scribbling notes as we, as we go. <laughs> um, so this has to do with entrepreneurship and has to do with the minimalism I'm talking about. And it was a point that you didn't touch on, but is related to what you're talking about, which is the psychological association. So um, the with the entrepreneurship, I want to mention um, to anyone listening that it is purely a psychological roadblock. I just read a scientific study that said statistically um, the Western world is the 1%. So even if you're only making 30,000 a year, 20,000 a year, and you think I'm so broke, you are literally in the 1% of the world population as far as finances and, and money. And there's ways there's so, especially in capitalist society, there's so many chances for you. And with the internet, as you mentioned, Jake, I think you said your wife is an internet entrepreneur with, she has mm. a self-help company, correct? Yes, exactly. So there's so many opportunities and the only thing holding you back is your own thinking about it. 
And also with the minimalism, you mentioned, you know, people are buying all this crap and you talked about um, the financial industry and also the media, but also there is a psychological um, attachment that people attach to material objects and they then they identify with it. And I think you did mention that with the status symbols. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because actually this is something that is really important to me, this idea of the psychological side. And in fact, that's the reason that I wrote my book, Becoming an Entrepreneur, because I wanted – there's loads of books out there that help you with kind of really specific things about become, about entrepreneurship, like how to do social media marketing on how and how to deal with your accounts and all that kind of stuff. And that's all really important. It's useful. But the psychological side is the, is the real challenge as far as I'm concerned. And the, what I call it is – yeah, it's the, the, the question of overcoming your employee conditioning. And I really see it as the way that, that we're taught in schools to follow leaders and look at the person at the, at the front of the room and to, you know, for them to be the person dispensing knowledge. You know, what we learn in school is obedience and conformity and apathy and Becoming an entrepreneur, you have to break out of that mindset because otherwise you take that obedience, conformity and apathy into the workplace and you look for the next boss to follow and the next job to tell you, you know, how to how to live and so forth. And actually, and, I'm sorry, Jake, I don't want to cut you off, but actually uh, I wanted to add to your point is that you're and if you step out of line and become a leader in the traditional school system, you're actually punished in certain ways. Totally, totally. You have your in your innovative side, your creativity, just just really uh, beaten out of you, basically, in terms of of being punished for for stepping out of line. And and that that's over a decade that we all spent in that environment, you know. And so it's like and the most developmental years of our psychology. Absolutely, you know, it's it's a prison for kids, and we're like ex cons trying to find our way on the world outside. And you know, so what I've tried to do is to talk about every aspect of entrepreneurship and to talk about the psychological challenge of breaking that conditioning of rather than thinking like an employee where someone tells you what what the organization is about and what your role in it is, thinking like an entrepreneur where you actually have to define the purpose of your business and go out there and create something that you're the one providing the enthusiasm and, and purpose for and, and all, all other aspects of the business too. So I completely agree with you about the psychological challenge and I, I think it's uh, a real that that's the really exciting and interesting thing that you have to do to become an entrepreneur. And the flip side of that is the point that you made about buying status symbols, because I think that very much goes with that obedience and conformity and apathy that we learn growing up. If we don't break out of that psychological mindset, we learn to compare ourselves to others in terms of things like what we're buying and, and all of this what kind, kind of, of car, stuff. what kind yeah. of how, how big your house I'm, is. Absolutely. And those things will never, they're, they're never authentic and they'll never actually bring you closer to your true passion, your true enthusiasm and the things that are going to make you feel like you're actually living and doing something interesting with your life. And so I think it's so vital to find a way to get deeper uh, and to really connect with who you actually are psychologically connect with yourself. And there's lots and lots of ways of doing that. But that is such an important part of your journey as an entrepreneur and as, as anybody who wants to actually do anything outside that debt-ridden mainstream culture that we all get trapped in if we don't if we're not careful. Now, I want to bring up a very important point because you're talking about being creative, you know, thinking outside the box, um, being an independent thinker, getting financial freedom, all this stuff, which is amazing. But I want to address another psychological issue that is a major roadblock to a lot of people who are extremely creative, which has been my experience. It's not it's not my belief system, but I've met so many creative people who actually associate financial freedom or money, let's just say money, or or financial know, know-how or savvy with the system, capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. So they have this belief system that, well, I'm going to be a starving broke artist or whatever. I'm going to be a starving broke creative person because to be financially free is to be part of the capitalistic, you know, money banking system, blah, 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 blah. And that's what I'm morally against because I'm a creative type. And what mm. you're saying is no, this financial freedom is giving you the time, you know, the space to be an authentic, true creative person. But I don't know if you've experienced this with creatives. A lot of creatives that I know are against 
you know, any type of financial know-how. And it, it actually is contradictory to what their goals are. But it's it's one of those psychological roadblocks. Absolutely. And I think that, again, is it's it comes very much from the conditioning about the role of money. And unfortunately, the thing is that there are also a lot of total misconceptions about financial freedom and about what people who are wealthy do with money. Because the, the kind of what you see in the media is you imagine that rich people are people who, you know, buy Grey Goose vodka and drive around <laughs> in, in, a, in a Mercedes Benz and they have a McMansion and they do all this stuff. And you know what's there's absolutely an evil, fast- There's an evil associated with it, I think. Totally, of, yeah. It, and, and, to a lot of creative people. Yeah, and not only that, that they've only got there because they're they, because they're willing to exploit other people and 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 do that kind of thing. And you know, there's two things I want to say about that. Firstly, that is not the purpose of money for me. Money, the purpose of money for me is freedom. That is what money is for. If you save money, if you earn money and save money, what you're doing is you're you're buying yourself more freedom. And, you know, freedom to do what you want, to pursue your own passion and to follow you know, your own bliss, basically, to find the, th- the things that are going to make you feel like you're doing something creative. And whatever that is, that's got to be good. That's got to be uh, providing uh, a, a, a force for good in the world. If you're a creative person, you want to do stuff that you think is good. Money is going to allow you to do that. It's not in order to you know, shovel more, <laughs> more crap into your storage units. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's not what it's for. But you know what the funny thing is? That's not even what truly wealthy people do. And this is the, the irony of it, is that if you look at the research, and the, and the best person who does research on this is a guy called Thomas Stanley, who wrote the book The Millionaire Next Door. And he also wrote a book called Stop I love Acting. That book. <laughs> yeah. And he also wrote a book called Stop Acting Rich. And what's really fascinating is that he looked at first generation millionaires and he looked at their spending habits. And what he found is that it's the millionaires who, who the first generation millionaires who made it, the entrepreneurs, small business owners, they're not driving Mercedes Benz. They drive the most uh, common car for millionaires is a Toyota. Right. which is fascinating because perfect jake i have a toyota <laughs> there you go you've got a you've got, you've got a millionaire car rosie i'm on track <laughs> <laughs> they don't live in mcmansions and this is the thing is that the fascinating thing about people who buy status symbols is that they're not generally they're not truly wealthy what they are is they're high income high consumption people and thomas stanley refers to that lifestyle as the aspirational lifestyle and this is so true that's so true the, everyone is, i know who is in a, a expensive german car and has the they are also swimming in debt over their eyeballs yeah, and this is the crazy thing is that they're doing that to impress other people who they think are rich because they're driving around in expensive cars and living in those big houses too. Those other people aren't rich either. It's, it's like <laughs> they're, they're all posers trying to impress each other by spending money on stuff. And it's terribly sad actually because actually what they're doing is they're, they're robbing themselves of the freedom that they could have had if they'd used that money to be frugal and to actually buy themselves the opportunity to live the life that they want to live and do what they want. I mean, for example, you know, what gives me fulfillment is writing books about entrepreneurship and financial freedom and ways to find freedom in an unfree world. That's what makes me feel free. I don't need a McMansion. I don't need to spend money on all that stuff. You know, that's what I'm using my financial independence for. And if you're a creative person and you want to uh, do pursue your art, then that's what money can give you, the freedom to do what you want. And the, and the truth is, the other thing about it is that um, – People have an idea that you can only get money if you rip people off, if you exploit other people. And, and it comes from a mentality where people view the world as being one where it has to be win-lose. That if somebody's got money, it must be because they've ripped somebody else off. And it's just not the case. You know, it, it, there's so much opportunity for you to create value in a win-win way where you gain something and the people that you, your customers – or clients or whoever it is, they also gain something and you can bring more value into the world. That's how economic development works. So I think it's it's really sad that that we've got this warped view that, you know, you have to be a rip-off art a rip-off artist if you're gonna make money, or you have to be an exploiter. When the truth is you can be principled, you can be ethical, and you can do the right thing, and you can still save money, and then you can use it for the best thing that you can spend money on that there is, which is freedom. Now, I want to mention 
what you just talked about, because that is huge, which is win-win and creating value. Because some of the most successful entrepreneurs in our current world are people who found a need and created a value or service for someone that was outside of themselves to make the world a better place. And that is basically what creative people want. It's you're not ripping someone off. You're not, you know, exploiting people in the third world. You're creating a service or value. And some of these services or values sometimes are not even a tangible thing. You know, a lot of millionaires that have been created in the past five, 10 years have been creating internet services that are, you know, that they're not creating any type of negative um, environmental footprint. And yet they're creating this amazing service through an app or whatever to help people. And they're still, they're also making money off of it. So thinking bigger than yourself, thinking outside of yourself, it gives you a higher purpose, you know, whether you're religious or not a spiritual purpose, or, you know, if you're atheist, just a purpose towards humanity. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to use the example that you just said, if you think of somebody who creates an app, a really good app, let's say it's an app that uh, is some kind of productivity app that saves people, I don't know, 20 minutes, half an hour a day because it allows them to organize their recipes more uh, efficiently or it allows them to manage their projects more efficiently, whatever it is. What you're doing, if you multiply that through all of the thousands of people who could download that app and just think of all the time that you've freed up that they now have to do other things, to spend time with their families or go out and have fun or create more value themselves, what you've done is you've just enriched the world. You've just created something that has actually liberated people, you know, thousands of people liberated 20 minutes every day because they're now more productive. And that is win-win. You know, they're paying you for your app. You're giving them something that uh, gives them more, more time and more freedom. That's totally win-win. And it's a, gr- a great example of a way that by being an entrepreneur, you can have a positive impact on the world. That, that's one of the things that excites me most about entrepreneurship is that I, it, it is a way to actually improve the world. It's how we got to all of the wonderful things that we have in terms of our quality of life, economic development, and civilization such that it is uh, up until now. It's all been because entrepreneurs have found new ways of doing more with less resources. That is so true. And it doesn't take a lot of money. I want to give an example of a woman. I don't know her personally, but I know of her. She was a single mother and took her $2,000 tax return opened an online business and it did so well. She was selling local uh, merchandise um, related to the city. So so taking different quirky things about the city that she lived in and putting it on t-shirts and other things, um, eventually opening a store. And she uses only locally produced um, products. So she not only, only took a $2,000 tax return, which is you know nothing, created a business, but also is putting money back into the community and now employing people in that community. So when you talk about win-win, that is what you're doing when you're creating businesses, when you're creating ideas, when you're being a creative person, which I would argue is what we were put here on this earth to do was to be creative and express ourselves to the highest um, vibration of who we are. Absolutely. Yeah. And you don't need, that's another myth about entrepreneurship that, you know, you can only start a business if, if you take out uh, huge loans or, or get uh, venture capital investment and so forth. And I mean, I bought into that myth to a certain extent and I did borrow a huge amount of money that I eventually uh, paid off and, and managed to, to make my business profitable. But the fact is that you know, there are so many people who start businesses on virtually nothing. And that's one of the healthiest things that you can do because if you finance your business by the revenue that you make from little tiny sales at first and then slowly snowballing more and more, you're always going to be on the right track because you're always going to be providing value and people are always going to be, you're always going to be doing something that people actually want. So you don't need venture capital. You don't need thousands and thousands of dollars because the likelihood is you probably won't spend it that well anyway. I certainly didn't. <laughs> a, a lot of the money that I borrowed, I, I totally wasted in the first, in the first year because I didn't know how to spend it properly. And it was only when I started focusing on growing my business through sales, through revenue, that I actually uh, really took off because that's when I knew I was doing the right thing because I had people who were paying for what I was doing. And a lot of financial gurus that I've read about, you know, all say the same thing. It's like if you can't manage a hundred dollars, you can't manage a hundred million dollars. So yeah. start start with the hundred dollars first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. 
Um, I did want to say one. Can I quickly oh, say yeah. one more thing about about artists and money and and uh, creatives and money? I also I know that this is another thing that I think is really important that we 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 get taught nothing about personal finance growing up. I mean, I I got taught nothing in school. It didn't even come up about managing money and investment and what money is and how the economy works. I had to learn all that stuff myself. And it's it's so this is something that. If you are a creative and you know you you're you haven't been given that education, you have to go and make that education for yourself. And once you do understand money better, the very simple basics of actually having a very clear budgeting system and tracking what you spend and knowing what you're spending your money on and knowing how to calculate things like your net worth so that you know how close you are to either getting out of debt or further on the line having uh, you know having a buffer for bad times and even further being financially free once you know those things and you have those skills which you can totally learn and there's loads of great resources out there you will feel so much less stressed about money because just the knowledge of where you're at is so important and so many people are kind of they're in debt but they also don't really know how how bad the situation is and that's that's double the stress because they don't really understand money and so i think it's a a, a really key task for everyone is to educate themselves financially well because you're not going to get any of the right education in school you've got to do it yourself and there's loads of ways of doing it and it totally pays off it does. And I want to, again, reiterate the psychological aspects of money because a lot of people think psychology, money, Rosie, what are you talking about? But when I have dealt with people with financial problems, they always have anxiety and emotional attachment to it. And that's something that I grew up with. And I really want people to understand that, they're, they're, you know, I'm, I, I know I talk about a lot about psychology on the podcast, but your way of thinking is everything. I grew up with the thinking that money was something to have, you know, anxiety over. My parents were always fighting over money. And actually, I think money is the number one people reason that people cite for divorces. So to to say that, you know, you're greedy or you're capitalistic or whatever to learn about finance is just silly. It's a basic thing of life and we should all not only learn the basics of money but also the psychology behind our spending because just like a lot of people do emotional eating, a lot of people use emotional spending to fulfill themselves totally yeah and that's money tends to be a subject because it's so key to everything and also because it you know it's something that you would it, we experience in the family as well it's something that does get really loaded and it means that with emotional you know baggage basically and it means that it, it's even harder to sort out practical problems about how much you're going to spend on this and that and how you're going to budget because there's all of this emotional weight that comes from the past about money. And I think that's one, one reason why it's so important to talk to your partner about money. And like you said, Rosie, this is one of the subjects that, that breaks people up because money is one of those things that people don't talk about. It's kind of taboo. And then when they do talk about it, it's a fight. And it's like, why have you done this? Why have you done that? And it turns into a, a, a cause of lasting sort of festering tension. And it's not easy. You know, my wife and I, money was one of the subjects that it was difficult to talk about. It was yes. really difficult. It was a cause of stress between us. And it was something that, you know, it wasn't like the first time we started talking seriously about money and what we wanted and how we want our household to work and what we do about money it wasn't like it was just you know, okay yeah let's agree this and that and it's all done no, <laughs> it, it was difficult it was really difficult and I just want to say that uh, even though it's difficult and even though it's stressful and even though you know you kind of feel like why are you pushing into a stressful subject and in the moment it totally pays off because if you can get to the point where money is not a taboo and you can actually uh, kind of lose the the heaviness of that emotional baggage. Disconnect from it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And find a way to be on the same side with your partner about money so that you're not fighting about it, but you've got a shared understanding of, you know, you compassionately understand each other's perspectives and what the emotional stuff is that, that comes up for the other person. And you can kind of work through that together. If you get to that point, then it, you have an ally in your financial life and that's so important because if you're not on the same page with your partner about money you're going to fight with each other and you're also going to get in each other's way in terms of achieving your goals so i think it's one of those issues that's not just important for your own psychology but it's super important if you want a happy relationship 
And I think a lot of people just avoid the topic. I have so many friends and relatives who say, well, you know, my hubby or wife can't deal with money. So we just split everything evenly. And then there's this sort sense of resentment, I feel, or I've noticed in these types yeah. of relationships where they're not on the same page. They just say, hey, you do your thing. I do my thing. As long as the bills are paid, we're fine. But then, you know, the, the psychology is not just about money. It's about upbringing as well because a lot of our belief systems that come from finance come from our childhood. So a lot of people feel attacked because – the way that they learned about money maybe was unhealthy and that is associated with their, their mother or father. And so they feel that you're attacking them if you say, well, this isn't, you know, finding Well, that's the way we did it in my household. What's wrong with that? You know, a lot of people get defensive when you, when you go into these core um, issues about finance, financial freedom, you know, um, they, they are attached because of their childhood beliefs. And we got to let go of this because that is what holds you back. And every single time a topic is taboo, Jake, that is when you have to talk about it because taboo basically means avoid. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, totally. I couldn't agree more. And and so yeah, I think it's it's and you're right, Rosie. It comes from people bringing stuff that they've unconsciously picked up in their families. That's just the way we do things in our family. You know, that's the stuff that kind of you, you don't even realize that you've learned it. You just it's just assumptions that we hold that we all have to critically. Um, evaluate and not just like react against them and do the opposite because we did you know but actually critically evaluate them and decide what do i want my family to be like what do i what do i want to let go of and do differently and and how can i work through often you know the pain and sense of loss of, of having to realize uh, you know that was tough the way that they did it that, that was bad for me in my own family i want to do things differently with my partner or my kids because i don't you know, because I know that 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 damaged me, that hurt me. So sometimes people avoid it too, because it's painful to think about things that were kind of dysfunctional in your own family. It's painful to actually acknowledge that. But we have to if we want to break the cycle and move on and have healthier relationships. And I think it's painful for people to admit, um, you know, I, there was a study I read that said that when people are proven wrong, when they're, you know, the, when all the data is against them, there's actual scientific statistics or things proving them wrong. Instead of admitting that they're wrong, the majority of people actually cling to their beliefs even more. Yeah. <laughs> so that goes against logic. You're saying, well, you're proven wrong. You know, let's just say I, I can't, you know, maybe someone says the earth is flat. And so you're showing them these pictures from space, showing the earth is round. You're showing all the scientific data. They will cling even more to their, their, that the earth is flat. And that's, you know, the human ego. And, you know, we, and we all know about, you know, Napoleon and the crazy, you know, tr conquerings of the world, which were all fueled by ego. And so we all have this ego inside of us and we need to learn to tame it. Otherwise, you know, how many of you out there know extremely stubborn people? Well, you know, you, moving forward in your life, you got to let go of that stubbornness and got to let go of that idea of being right. And Jake, you made an amazing point about you know, relationships, because me and my husband were not on the same page when it came to finance when we were first married, and we had many fights about it. And once we worked all of it out, and you know, he definitely didn't have a good financial upbringing, and I definitely didn't have a good financial upbringing. Now that we're on the same page, it's actually empowering and a sense of pride when we meet our financial goals. And it's created a bond with us that's even closer instead of every single time we talk about money it's a fight now when we talk about money it's very logical and and we when we reach these goals which we've reached a couple of them recently it's ecstatic you know you just feel like a team like you said yeah absolutely and i i've this is something that i've noticed in the all the people i've interviewed who are working towards financial independence all of them have got supportive partners and supportive spouses. It's so key, you know. And I remember when we spoke last time, you were telling me about the way that you and your husband have worked it so that one of you, you were able to put one of your incomes into investment and the other income into supporting the household. I mean, that's such an incredible, powerful alliance and a way to achieve your goals together and i can well understand why it feels good and why it feels like you know an achievement because you're on the same side and that's such a wonderful thing to have in a relationship actually 
you know, I feel closer to my wife because we've been able to talk about money and because we're on the same side and we share the same values and we're working towards the same goals. And everyone who I've interviewed who's on the way towards financial independence or has reached financial independence, they all have supportive partners. Because if you don't, then one of the partners is going to be, you know, spending Dragging you money. down. Dragging yeah, exactly. Down. Exactly. And that's going to lead to fights and everything else. So I think it's awesome what you and your husband have managed to do in terms of, you know, working out how you want to work forward together. And I think it's a really great example. And since we've switched to that model, the our savings and our investings have compounded because, like you said, we're on the same team. You know, we're we are living just off of his income, but actually we live such a minimalist lifestyle that it's his income and then there's extra money. And I just want to let you guys know out there, my husband and I do not make a lot of money. And I, I've said this on several podcasts, several years, you know, we we have been um close to what is considered, you know, lower middle class or poverty line, but we've still been able to live on one income because, you know, we don't go crazy. And we've actually developed the interpersonal skills, not the consumption skills. So I, you know, have increased my cooking and I actually love cooking. And, and so we save so much money when I'm buying these fresh, healthy ingredients, cooking at home versus spending, you know, hundreds and thousands of dollars going out to eat, which a lot of people can, that's like the majority of their budget is going out to eat. I'm not against it. And we do go out to eat, but I'm just saying that's one example of developing my skills instead of consuming, consuming, consuming. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, that is a good way to compound. What do you, do you and your wife have a certain you know, plan. I know you guys are already out of the rat race, but what what is your plan that maybe other people could follow? Yeah, I mean that's another thing that we do too. You know, my wife is a, a great cook, and we we. I mean, it's a little different when we're living in Mexico because, frankly, it, it's just so cheap to eat out. That we that we <laughs> like eat out a lot. There. <laughs> it's like it doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, to to cook at home. But that's a, a really important thing. You know, we don't have a car. I, I've never actually owned a car. I'm in my 40s and I've never owned a car. And that's only possible if you live in cities which are kind of dense and they have lots of, uh, you know, kind of dense street network. That, that's the kind of place that I love to live anyway. So when we're traveling, you know, we tend to go to places that are very uh, pedestrian friendly. Mm -hmm. And in terms and of possession... Healthy. Yeah, absolutely. It's healthy. But most of my exercise is from, from walking around. Uh, and in terms of possessions, you know, I mean, the, the key thing is that we're on the same page about the kind of lifestyle that we want to live. It's not important to either of us to have loads of stuff, which means that, you know, when we've talked about what, what do we want our life to be like, you know, how do we want to live? One of the things that, that we're really excited about is the opportunity to travel and see different parts of the world. And the, you know, the great thing is that a lot of the world is a lot cheaper than the UK and the US. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> so actually, you know, what we found is that in our travels uh, in the last couple of years, we've been saving money by going abroad. By because, <laughs> yeah, because the cost of living here is just so high. So given that those are the things that we want together, you know, we've decided that we're just going to get rid of all this stuff and get rid of the, the flat here in the UK and we'll rent out places as we travel. And we're not going to, you know, we're going to be staying in one place for like six months at a time to get a feeling of what it's like to actually live there and, and so forth. So we're not going to be traveling like every, every week or so. We're just going to slowly move around. And that's, that came from the process of actually sharing with each other, you know, what our hopes and dreams for the future are and finding a way to, to work out, you know, how, how do you want that to work uh, what is our lifestyle going to look like? And, and we're on the same page. Now, this is just a logistical question. Obviously, everything is mobile and online now. So you can, you know, pay credit card bills and other things. You don't need a central address. But I know a lot of these companies do require a, a physical mailing address. What do you guys use, like a PO box or just... Yeah, that's a good question because, you know, in the last couple of years, we, we've been coming back to the UK. So we've always had a physical address here and we've also had a PO box that we've been able to use while we've been abroad for just for to forward our mail to. A lot of people use Earth Class Mail in the States, you know, that, that you can actually, there are companies that you can just get your stuff sent to. Um, but there are a couple of logistical things that I'm still not 100% sure how we can resolve. You know? <laughs> You're figuring but, it out too. <laughs> yeah, we're figuring it out as we go, you know. Um, I, I'm I'm pretty sure that there's going to be uh, – I don't think we'll keep the P.O. box because that 
ultimately someone's got to open the box and get the stuff out and scan it and send it to us and stuff. So I think we'll probably go with one of the companies that will do that for us. Um, but yeah, we haven't worked out those, that, that that's the kind of detail that we're going to have to work out before we leave. <laughs> I feel a third book coming. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think you're right. <laughs> because people that get out of the rat race, they're going to be like, Jake, we're out of the rat race now. What do we do? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And I just want to let you guys know, for those of you who are listening, who say, oh, my God, I could never do that. I need to shop. I need to do this. I need to spend money. Um, there are actually websites out there um, dedicated and also, you know, just message boards. And, and, and there's so that's the best part about the Internet is connecting with other people that you don't necessarily have to eliminate all of those addictions. As a former shopaholic, I actually um, realized, like I said, Jake, that a lot of the shopping compulsions are are just emotional. So sometimes I need to physically buy something just to make myself feel good as a girl or I need to go shopping. I go thrift store shopping or I will make up a rule that whenever I buy something new, I have to give something away. So that way I'm creating a win-win situation. You know, someone out there gets something old that maybe I'm not wearing. I get something new. So it's kind of like recycling. And I've noticed that the, the high that I get from shopping it doesn't matter if I go to Saks Fifth Avenue or if I go to Goodwill. It's still the same high of me just getting something new. So you can easily, easily switch to thrift stores or secondhand stores or just going to a low end place instead of a high end place. It's actually the exact same high, Jake. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, yeah, I wanted to share with you a, a quick story about that. Can I share with you a quick story about my, my feelings on, on money as well? Yes, yes, Cause, yes. Because, um, you know, when I first sold my business... I kind of thought like, wow, this is awesome. I've sold my business. I, I guess I should go and buy stuff because I can. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, you know, what do, what do I want to buy? And I wasn't really sure. And I, I, bought myself, I bought myself a leather jacket and a couple of other things like that. But I wasn't okay. – I, I was never I've, – I've always been fairly frugal. So, um, and I did buy this, this, this flat that we're living in now. So I, I, for the first time, I bought a property um, without needing to use a mortgage and stuff. But you know what I found afterwards is that as I learned more about – financial freedom and the opportunity to 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 be able to do what I want with my day, what I realized is if I go crazy now and start buying loads of stuff, I will lose my financial freedom. I will be back into needing to go and get a, a nine to five job at some point. And so for me, you know, when I think about nice stuff that I want to buy, I also think about the thing that I value most, which is the freedom. And that's what motivates me when I'm downsizing and getting rid of stuff and looking at how we can live really frugally and not spend a lot of money. I, yeah, it's the freedom. I know what the end game is, which is I want us to be able to travel the world and do fun stuff. And I think that applies to every level of, of freedom that you have. The more you can get rid of debt and the more you can get rid of stuff and, and improve your net worth and give yourself financial freedom, the more opportunity you have to live a life that you want. And that's why there's always something that you're, if you go out and buy stuff, then you're, you're always uh, giving away freedom with when you do that. And that's the way that I sort of trick myself into thinking about it and, and, and motivate myself is to remember what it is that I'm, that I'm buying with that money. That is a very, very good point. And, you know, I'm not going to say that it's easy because me and my husband have actually, we recently have had a lot of friends um, upgrading, buying bigger houses, buying buying certain things. And I'm telling you, Jake, I got bit by the bug a couple times and I had to snap myself out of it where I said, well, well, maybe we should upgrade. Maybe and you get <laughs> you get sucked in. Yeah, totally. totally. And, and, and then I. It was about a month where I was like, oh, maybe we should get a bigger flat. Maybe we should go to a, you know, a, a nicer place. And, and I kept going on and on and thinking about it. My thoughts got really manic. And then I was like, wait a minute. I snapped myself out of it. I was like, we are totally on point with our financial goals right now. And if we do this, we will be actually step, stepping backwards, not forwards. Kind of what you said. Yeah, absolutely. I know that pull as well. When you see other people and think like, well, I suppose I, I suppose that's the next step. We should go and buy more stuff. <laughs> but um, but that, that's the great thing about the internet is that, you know, I mean, this is, this is really uh, motivating for me to be able to talk to you and to, to, to hear you having similar values and so forth. And for other people, there are resources out there that, that they can find where they can find people 
through the internet who share their values and find ways of not feeling alone in the process, you know, because as well as I think it's super important to have a supportive spouse and it really helps, but it's also super important to have a supportive social network and friends and people that you can, you can sort of realize that you're not alone in, in, in going against the mainstream. Yes. And, and like I said, it doesn't take a lot. I know um, if you guys check out the voluntarylife.com, Jake has a lot of information on there. That's his website. But, you know, again, some of some of the financial gurus that I've read online and other, you know, out of the rat race thinkers, they'll say, oh, well, I got out of the rat race and blah, blah, blah. But they were making, you know, two hundred or three hundred thousand dollars a year when they were working a job. I'm like, that's a, that's not the average person. But again, my husband and I are very average. You know, he works in IT as a technician. You know, I am a comedian and we don't make that much money, but we're almost out of the rat race, Jake. Five more years if we stay on track. So fingers crossed. <laughs> awesome. That sounds great. That's, that's uh, excellent. And I've actually interviewed people who have totally average levels of, of, of wages. Income. Yeah. yeah. And there are people, I mean, obviously it's, it's easier. If you've got a high income, if you're, if you're doing something like really specialist, then it's easier and it's faster. Um, but there's lots of examples of people who are finding their own way of living more free. And some people don't even pursue financial freedom. Like we talked last time about the unjobbing route where you, you find a way to live a lifestyle that's incongruent, that, that's congruent with your values, even though you may not actually have financial freedom. And so there are other ways that you can do it on less money too. And hopefully you'll also, you know, when I, my next book, the, the one that I've just finished writing, is, is going to provide some examples of that because that's it's about four different ways to quit the rat race and outline some of the options both on higher and lower incomes. Yes, and I just want everyone to know that it's extremely possible, though, because like I said, a lot of the books I've read, the person was like, oh, I'm out of the rat race, yet they were making two or 300000 a year. And so it was a lot easier for them. But mm -hmm. um, definitely having a partner in crime helps. So if you are have a spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend and you guys are not on the same page financially, that it's probably a great step to move forward to. And I'm 31. My birthday just passed. So I will be hopefully retired if I, we stay on track by the time I'm 35, 36. And I just started in the past few years. You know, that's one of my biggest regrets was not starting as soon as I got out of college, but uh, unfortunately, I did a typical thing and wasn't aware of some of these um, issues. But, you know, the sooner you get started, the quicker you can get out. And I want to mention because you did talk about your, your second book that is coming out now. And um, is there a title or no? Yeah, it's four ways to quit the rat race. That's and, simple. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm currently, I've just finished it and uh, I've, I've given it to um, my wife and a couple of uh, close friends to give me the, the first round of feedback. And then I'm going to get uh, my listeners on my podcast to, to give me some feedback because that was incredibly helpful last time with, uh, with my book. And then I'll, I'll release it in a couple of months. Okay. So guys, check out that book. It will be released in a few months. And what inspired you to write the second book? Well, really, just the stories of people I've met through my podcast, because I you know, my the book Becoming an Entrepreneur is about how I achieved my own freedom through entrepreneurship and through selling a business. And I wanted to find out about other ways that other people have found freedom. And so I've interviewed a lot of people on my podcast and, you know, talked to them about the different things that they're doing. And this book is really putting together all the stories of different people that I've met and talked to who found ways of, of, of finding freedom themselves. And I've put it together and really uh, sort of tried to outline the four different approaches that, that, that uh, kind of summarizes all the, the fantastic stories and, and wonderful people that I've interviewed. So that's what this, uh, that's what this book is. And you're in it, Rosie. I've got, you know, the oh examples. Oh my gosh, Jake. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as I said, I think, you know, what you and your husband are doing uh, is, is just really inspirational uh, as a way of uh, working towards financial freedom together. So you're in it and uh, lots of other people I've spoken to. Well, I will definitely let everyone know. And guys, there will be a link on outoftheboxpodcast.com <laughs> to The Voluntary Life and, and Jake's other endeavors. And, and hopefully when the book comes out, all of the Out of the Box listeners will go on Amazon. Is that where you're releasing? Yes. Yeah. And check it out. Um, we have to wrap up, but I just wanted to know, um, what is your your next goal? You're, you said you're, you and your wife are looking to move. What city? What's going on with you? Like, what's the next adventure for Jake? Well, you know, it really depends on when we sell this. Where, in terms of where we go next, it depends on when we sell this flat in the UK. Because if it's in the, the European summertime, then we'll stay in summer. 
we'll stay here in Europe. If it's in the European winter time, then we'll go off somewhere nice and warm. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not sure where our first step might be. It might be Berlin because that's a wonderful city that I know well. I used to live there. Or it might be Thailand or Mexico. We'll, we'll have to see. Um, but, yeah, the next step is really this is the big thing for us is get rid of everything and go on our, uh, on our endless voyage, basically. And I'm, I'm really dedicated to writing. I've got a number of other book projects that I'm uh, working on, so I'm going to continue doing that. And my wife's got her website and her, her coaching business, and she's continuing to do that. And, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to try this uh, permanent travel experience and see how it works out. And um, what is... Is there any type of attachment or fear with the getting rid of everything? Or are you are you just you're ready to go? You know the thing is that because we've been doing this for a couple of years now, I just want to get it done. <laughs> I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm I'm I've now I'm I'm I, I feel really uh, great about the experience. It was just totally I mean a lot of doubt and fear and unknowns in the beginning. And, you know, it's taken us, well, it's been two years that we've been spending six months abroad, coming back, spending six months abroad, coming back. But now it's got to the point where having spent that much time away from all my stuff, I know I'm done with it. Yeah, I'm done with it. (laughs) And also the other thing is, you know, okay, so let's say we go traveling and we spend a year living abroad and we think, wouldn't it be nice to have a place and we made a terrible mistake? Well, we'll come back and we'll, we'll you know, we'll get another flat. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not going to be the end of the world, but this is such an exciting adventure that, um, you know, even if it, even, even if we do try it and for some reason we decide that, yeah, I mean, there's lots of big unknowns. For example, we want to have kids. And that, so that's going to be an interesting thing. How's that going to work, you know, while we're slowly traveling through the world? So there's lots of things to work out. And we may find that somehow it's not as great as we thought it was. But it, but it's such an exciting thing that we're just going to do it and see how it goes. Yes. And, and even though there are unknowns, and like you said, maybe it won't be what you guys think. The main issue here is that what I want people to know is that you have the choice to make, whereas some people don't have that choice. They're trapped in the nine to five. They can't even say, hey, I might want to travel the world and maybe it might not work out. That's not even an option. And so mm. you have literally total freedom in doing whatever you want and making any decision. Your life is your life. It doesn't belong to anyone else. It doesn't belong to, you know, JP Morgan Chase Mortgage Company. It doesn't yeah. belong to, you know, Um, Citibank credit card bills. What I want people to understand is that, you know, people who are listening and scoffing and saying, oh, I could never get rid of anything, everything, or I could never, you know, go down. I need all this stuff is that you are in your own indentured servitude. And Jake, what you have is literally pure freedom. And a lot of people think, you know, slavery doesn't exist anymore in in the 21st century, but there, it is a form of slavery. Yeah. If you don't have a choice about what, how how you're living, then little by little, you can get so stuck that you know you wake up one day and realize that you're not you're not enjoying your life you're not happy and yet all that time has got behind you and what have you got to show for it a bunch of crap you know and that's what I don't want that life so that's why that that's another thing that helps me realize that I don't need uh, to buy more stuff because you know I, I the freedom that you talk about is the thing that is most important to me so yeah I'm I'm super happy and excited about it and I hope that by writing about my experience and others I can help provide some tools and inspiration and help for other people who 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 really value freedom too to find their own way to freedom so you are definitely creating a win-win Jake how can people find you where are you next what's your Twitter tell everyone so they can follow you and, and and look up your stuff and look up your first book and hopefully your second book when it comes out soon Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. My website is thevoluntarylife.com. And that's the website for the podcast. So you're very welcome to come along and subscribe. You can get a free book about negotiation if you join my mailing list on that website. My Twitter is at the voluntary. And you can find all the links for social media and and stuff on thevoluntarylife.com. The book uh, that is on Amazon now as a paperback and an ebook and an audiobook on Audible is Becoming an Entrepreneur How to Find Freedom and Fulfillment as a Business Owner by me, Jake DeSillis. So you can find that on Amazon or you can just go to thevoluntarylife.com and there's links to it there. Well, thank you so much, Jake. And I'm excited to say that you are the first out of the box regular. So that's a big deal. 
<laughs> that's I'm I'm honoured, and uh, yeah, I will definitely tell you when uh, when the book comes out with uh, with you in it, and uh, and send you a copy, Rosie. You can so you can read what I've written. <laughs> awesome. Well, hopefully we will have Jake back in another six months to a year and find out what city he's in, what he's doing, and how much fun he's having with his new financially free life. I will send you positive vibes, guys. Are you looking for a flat in the UK? Email Jake. (laughs) (laughs) Um, This has been Out of the Box Podcast with Rosie Tran. Guys, we are on Stitcher, SoundCloud, and iTunes. As always, you can find us at outoftheboxpodcast.com. And don't forget SoundCloud, guys. We have awesome downloads on iTunes and Stitcher, but SoundCloud is a little bit sad and lonely. So if you're a SoundCloud subscriber or member, go on Out of the Box um, Podcast on SoundCloud and click on the follow button so we can have a few more followers on there. That helps us out a lot. And that's it. Check out our sponsor, hugmeteas.com. Spread love, give a hug, hugmeteas.com. This has been Out of the Box Podcast.